Hello, my name is Mario DeGangi. I'm a professor of English at Lehman College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm delighted to introduce you to The Winter's Tale, one of Shakespeare's most challenging and moving plays. Let's begin with Shakespeare's title. A Winter's Tale is a fairy tale, a story told to children sitting around a winter fire. Fairy tales, like Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, are supposed to be implausible, magical, and fill you with wonder. The Winter's Tale certainly fits the bill, with its ghost, oracle, and bear that chases a hapless character across the stage. Even characters within the play describe its implausible events as like an old tale. The play's self-consciousness about narrative forms raises the question of genre. What kind of tale is The Winter's Tale? When Shakespeare wrote The Winter's Tale around 1610, a new kind of drama called tragicomedy was becoming popular on the London stage. As the name suggests, tragicomedies include comic and tragic elements. More precisely, tragicomedies are comic in structure in that they conclude in celebration and reunion, but they reach these generally harmonious ends via tonally tragic episodes involving violence, death, incest, political upheaval, intense psychological suffering, and so on. The four plays that Shakespeare wrote or co-wrote between 1608 and 1612, The Winter's Tale, Pericles, Cymbeline, and The Tempest, share these characteristics to different degrees. Another term commonly used today for these four late plays is romance. Romance motifs came to Shakespeare's culture largely through medieval chivalric tales featuring questing knights, beautiful princesses, monsters, and magic. Although Shakespeare's romances avoid knights battling monsters, they use the romance motifs of long, difficult journeys or quests, disguised or concealed identities, supernatural influences, and the reunion of long-separated lovers or family members. Romance motifs are also evident in some of Shakespeare's earlier comedies, such as the comedy of errors and Twelfth Night. In Twelfth Night, for instance, Viola and her twin brother Sebastian are separated after a shipwreck. Viola disguises herself as a man, suffers frustration in love, and for her loyalty and endurance is eventually rewarded with marriage to a duke and reunion with her brother. The romance, tiefs, uh, the romance motifs of The Winter's Tale also center on female characters. Accused of adultery by her husband Leontes, King of Sicily, Hermione gives birth to a daughter, Perdita, whom Leontes deems a bastard and exiles far from home. The play jumps ahead 16 years to find Perdita living as a shepherdess, exceptionally loved, lovely and refined, yet unaware of her royal identity. In a fantastic turn of events, a long journey brings Perdita back to Sicily, where she discovers her true identity, reunites with her father, and receives permission to marry the young prince whom she loves. As is typical of romance, The Winter's Tale ends like a comedy. If The Winter's Tale shares features with Shakespeare's comedies, it also shares features with Shakespeare's tragedies. You might think of its first three acts as a mini-tragedy. This tragedy takes place in the court of Leontes in some unspecified era of the ancient pagan past. Like Othello, Leontes develops a raging suspicion that his wife has cheated on him. Whereas Othello is duped into this false belief by Iago, Leontes' jealousy seems to spring instantaneously from his own brain. Worse, he believes that Hermione has been having an affair with his best friend, Polixenes, king of Bohemia, and that she is pregnant with Polixenes' baby. Like King Lear, Leontes refuses to listen to the good advice of his counselors, particularly the outspoken Paulina, all of whom insist on Hermione's innocence. Instead, Leontes plunges his family and court into chaos and pays a terrible price for his tyrannical behavior. By the end of Act Three, Hermione has died of grief. Racked with guilt, Leontes enters a long period of mourning, a kind of extended bitter winter of discontent. 
At precisely this juncture, Shakespeare brings in an allegorical figure of time to serve as chorus. Incredibly, time informs us that the story is jumping ahead 16 years. Abandoning Leontes to his grief and regret, the play shifts to a more celebratory mode. It moves from winter in Sicily to summer in Bohemia, where shepherds and shepherdesses are throwing a sheep shearing festival. The expansive, vital energy of the sheep shearing festival is expressed in the 847 line scene Shakespeare devotes to it, one of the longest scenes in all of Shakespeare. To depict the love between Perdita, a humble shepherdess, and Florizel, the heir of King Polixenes, Shakespeare draws on the resources of pastoral poetry as he did in his earlier festive comedy, As You Like It. Following what we've seen of Leontes' destructive misogyny, the flourishing of young, passionate love in the countryside comes as an enormous relief. But Bohemia is no paradise. When reading this scene, pay attention to Perdita's anxiety about her festival disguise as Flora, goddess of flowers. Why is Perdita so uncomfortable about dressing up like a goddess? What does she have to fear from Florizel? Like Leontes, Polixenes flies into a rage at what he regards as the treachery of a sexually desirous woman. Polixenes blames Perdita for having seduced Florizel away from his princely responsibilities. Threatened with disinheritance, Florizel remains faithful to Perdita, but female sexuality has once again taken the brunt of violent patriarchal distrust. The last act of the play, which returns us to Sicily, offers a final chance for characters to learn from the mistakes of the past. Another woman, Paulina, might be said to dominate the action of the final scenes. Sixteen years earlier, Paulina had vigorously defended Hermione's innocence, only for Leontes to threaten and insult her as a scold, bawd, and witch. Now, Paulina is the king's most trusted advisor. In the final scene, Paulina invites Leontes and Perdita to her estate to witness the unveiling of a newly completed statue of Hermione. I won't spoil the conclusion of the play for you, but it's a spectacular piece of theater. As I indicated earlier, romances are generally comic in structure, and many critics have admired what they regard as the movement towards forgiveness, reconciliation, and redemption at the end of The Winter's Tale you should decide for yourself whether or not The Winter's Tale achieves a happy ending. Do you see forgiveness and reconciliation or something else? Are you hopeful for the future of these characters? Does the shadow of tragedy still linger over their lives? After so much suffering and loss, can we ever really come home?